Welcome back. Welcome back to SCSJ 2020 from Trieste. We are virtually connected from all over the world. We are happy uh, to have you all with us, even if only online. Um, I'm here to uh, introduce the next speaker. Um, uh, the next speaker won't be connected uh, live because she couldn't attend, attend uh, today. She recorded her speech. Uh, this means that you won't have, unfortunately, the opportunity to uh, ask questions at the end of the presentation, but please send them through the question and answer tool or uh, through the SESJ 2020 website, and she will be happy to answer uh, by email or we will find another way to uh, send you uh, her answer. So I will introduce now Siri Carpenter. Uh, for those who, uh, that, who don't know her, Siri Carpenter is a co-founder and editor-in-chief of the Open Notebook, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to help science journalists improve their skills and is editor of uh, the book, uh, The Craft of Science Writing, who went out a uh, few months ago in February, 2020, just in time to help us covering the COVID-19 pandemics. She's an award-winning science journalist and editor whose writing and editorial work, work has appeared in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, Science Discover, National Geographic Online, Scientific American and many other outlets. She lives in Madison, Wisconsin, and she is the 2018-2020 president of the National Association of Science Writers. So I give the floor, the virtual floor to Siri Carpenter. Thank you so much, Daniela. It's great to be here as part of the ECSJ meeting, and it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk with you today about the craft of science writing and some of the core skills that journalists need to cover science well. I'll be framing many of my remarks today within the context of the coronavirus pandemic, but I hope it will be obvious that the aspects of craft that we're going to dive into today are by no means unique to COVID coverage. Last February, The Open Notebook published our first book, The Craft of Science Writing. It covers many different aspects of science writing, such as how to find and pitch story ideas to editors, how to post, how to, excuse me, how to spot shady statistics in scientific papers, and how to cover risk and uncertainty. Within a month after the book was published, we found ourselves, like everyone here, at a kind of inflection point. Suddenly, we are all living through the science story of the century. As I record this today, the global death toll from the COVID-19 pandemic has just passed 800,000, and more than 23 million people have been infected. Among the many profound effects that this catastrophe has had and continues to have at every level of society, it has turned thousands of reporters overnight into science writers whether or not they had any experience or training in how to report in, on health and science. In July, the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism and the University of Toronto surveyed journalists from a range of different international news organizations. They found that only 4% had experience in reporting on health-related stories. The same survey found, though, that almost three quarters of the respondents were at that point doing so. That's not surprising given the enormous disruption that this virus has caused in virtually every area of life. Of course, I don't need to tell any of you this. Every one of us has been living it. In fact, that's why I'm recording this presentation in advance of the ECSJ meeting. Right now, as you're watching this, I'm on the road helping my 18-year-old daughter move back to the university she abruptly left behind in March. And as you can imagine, I've been thinking a lot about university campuses and what the coming weeks and months will bring to them. It's impossible to know what university life will be like six months from now, just as six months ago, it was impossible to believe what it would soon become. And although I'm not a higher education reporter, I suspect that those who are could not have anticipated last winter 
that soon they would be turning much of their attention towards stories on topics like PCR testing and contact tracing and COVID clusters. Not long ago, COVID cluster wasn't even a term that you could Google. Now it's the specter that is haunting campuses. And so today, to be a higher education reporter is very often, I think, to be a health and science reporter. The same is true for many of those who normally cover business or politics or parenting or sports or the arts or travel or city government. Imagine what the implications of that are. Imagine what would happen if all of us science journalists were overnight wrenched away from our scientific journals and our p-values and our effect sizes and we're told that for the foreseeable future, we will now be reporting on, say, the ups and downs of global stock markets, or on debates over government appropriations for military shipbuilding, or on the inner workings of the FIFA soccer organization. I'm going to take a wild guess and say that for many science reporters, the results would be spotty at best. In fact, it would be shocking if science journalists who were asked to cover such topics without any specialized training were able to do so flawlessly. If they were able to bring a nuanced understanding of the necessary context and the arcane details that those stories might involve. Some of us might not even pronounce FIFA correctly. By the same token, it would also be shocking if journalists did not make some mistakes in a tsunami of science topics that are part of the pandemic story, from aerosol transmission to antibody testing to vaccine development. That's especially true given the huge amount of misinformation that surrounds many aspects of this pandemic, and given the absence of clear science-driven guidance from our top elected leaders, at least in the U.S. and in some other countries too. And in fact, yes, journalists have made errors along the way some of them serious and with long-lasting effects. For example, early on, many journalists, myself included, were too quick to accept the idea that this new coronavirus was probably going to be less of a threat than the seasonal flu. Likewise, communications around the benefits of wearing face masks have been very muddled, even in the past several weeks. And then there's the sensationalized story about how the virus is mutating, a story that a few months ago consumed a lot of oxygen and caused some people to panic unnecessarily. It would be tempting and self-serving to say that it was only non-science journalists who have made such mistakes, but that's not the case. I think most science reporters covering the virus could think of some aspect of the topic that has tripped them up. And that too is not surprising, given what a complicated and fast-moving story this has been. When the ECSJ program committee invited me to speak here, they asked me to reflect on some of the basic knowledge that's needed to cover science, especially if you're not specifically trained in the field. Of course, that's a lot of ground to cover. Just at the Open Notebook, over the last decade, we've published more than 400 articles and a book on the craft of science writing. And don't worry, I'm not going to try to summarize all that in the next 20 minutes. But I'd like to talk about a few key skills that I think are essential to covering science well. Whether you're a journalist who specializes in covering science, or you're a reporter normally on some other beat, or you're an editor who wants to equip your team of reporters with the right tools. What I'm going to focus on are three global skills that I believe are fundamental to good science writing. The ability to make sense of data and recognize the stories that the numbers are telling the ability to find the right kinds of sources and then ask them the right kinds of questions. And finally, the ability to communicate something deeper about the true nature of science. No one is immediately good at all of this. Each of these skills takes practice and feedback and learning from mistakes. One of the most important roles that all science journalists play is to deal with data and to put numbers in context that is meaningful and informative for readers. Oftentimes we talk about data journalism as if it were something totally separate and distinct from the rest of science journalism. But in many respects, all science writing is data journalism to varying degrees of complexity. When a reporter is writing about a new study, they're trying to understand fundamentally how the data were collected, what the results mean, and what the limitations of that research are. 
And then they're trying to show as clearly as possible what significance the results have for their readers. Doing that requires a number of different skills. The first is deciding what data to report on in the first place. And that requires asking yourself questions like, are the data, data credible? Where do they come from? Do they tell a compelling story? What do the numbers not show? And just as important, what patterns do the numbers reveal that are most important for readers to understand? That last part is crucial because people have a finite capacity for taking in information. We can't just pour an endless stream of raw information over people's heads and expect them to be able to use it to make decisions. We have to bring order and meaning to the numbers. And we've seen that very clearly over the course of this pandemic. There's been a deluge of information about the virus and about the carnage that it has caused, and people have gotten worn out. If you've been trying to keep track of data on COVID-19, even just at your local level, you've probably found the amount of information to be overwhelming. The county where I live in Wisconsin provides daily COVID updates on a dashboard that includes information on total tests administered, daily and weekly averages of new positive tests and of the percent of total tests that are positive, cumulative cases, current hospitalizations, current number of patients in intensive care, cases ever hospitalized, and deaths. And then all of these figures can be broken down by age, sex, race, and ethnicity. It is vital that reporters and the public have access to this kind of information. But reporters need guidance about how to deal with all these numbers. This is something that the journalist Betsy Ladegetz talked about in an article that she wrote for the Open Notebook a few weeks ago titled Interrogating Data. She writes in her article that data analysis can often feel like chipping away at a stone in order to make a sculpture. That sculpting process is one of figuring out which numbers are going to be most meaningful for readers, which are less meaningful, which might be artifacts of the way that data were collected or reported, and which ones might be indicators of larger trends. A really great example of this is a piece that Politico's Beatrice Jin created back in March and which is still continually updated. The Politico piece has one purpose, to show country by country how often someone new tests positive for COVID-19. From the moment you open the story, you see a stacked column of orange horizontal bars, each representing one country. As the seconds tick by, the orange bars widen, expanding from left to right, some expanding much more quickly than others. Next to each bar is a counter that shows how many new cases have been identified in that country since you started reading the article. For Italy today, the counter increases by one person every minute and a half. For the US, the counter currently increases by one person every two seconds. What's noteworthy about this graphically driven article is that Jin doesn't try to convey every statistic associated with the virus. She shows readers one thing in a very visually powerful way. How fast is this virus spreading country by country? The second set of skills that I wanna talk about today has to do with the decisions we make about who to use as sources for our stories and the questions that we ask of them. Of course, there's one thing that science stories almost inevitably feature and that's experts but it's very important to find the right experts for our stories. Many of the instances in which stories about COVID-19 have been erroneous or have propagated mistaken information are instances in which the scientists who were quoted didn't actually have specific expertise about the relevant science. An example is the widely shared mutant coronavirus story that briefly caused so much anxiety back in May. The story that kicked off all the consternation quoted only one researcher who was not involved with the study. And that researcher was not someone who had specific expertise in a field that was relevant to the study, such as virology genetics. That case is a perfect example of why it's important to not only seek out multiple independent sources, but to look at their record of published work to see if they're trying to answer questions that are relevant to the study you're calling them about. 
In vetting sources, it's also important to check the disclosures given at the end of papers to make sure that your sources don't have conflicts of interest that they had to declare, but that they might not be keen to tell you about unless you ask. Alexandra Witsey's chapter in the Craft of Science writing on how to read a scientific paper gives tips on how to find clues to these possible conflicts. In addition to finding the appropriate kinds of subject matter experts, it's also valuable to look for experts who can help you evaluate from a statistical point of view the quality of the evidence you're reporting on. If you're reporting on science with any regularity, it's a good idea to strike up friendly relationships with a few statisticians who you can turn to for help in making sense of aspects of research that might be hard to wade through. I also want to focus particular attention on the critical importance of including a truly diverse range of sources in science stories. This is historically one of science journalism's greatest weaknesses. On the whole, our stories too seldom reflect the diversity of the society we live in. That's true both of scientist sources and of other sources whose lived realities are central to the stories we tell. That lack of diversity is reflected in which stories get told, how they're told, and whose voices are heard. And for that reason, media coverage that fails to consider diverse voices is inherently incomplete and lacks accuracy. And by overlooking communities that have historically been marginalized, we perpetuate systemic injustices that have echoed through generation after generation. In doing so, we also contribute to continuing distrust of both science and journalism within those communities. This is as true in coverage of COVID-19 as it is in coverage of topics such as climate change and gun violence and environmental health and many other subjects. Including diverse sources in science stories is not rocket science, but it takes more than good intentions. It takes an ongoing conscious commitment it's something that needs to be a regular priority, not a one-time effort in response to a moment of racial reckoning. A couple of months ago, The Open Notebook created a resource page in which we lay out many different uh, strategies for finding and cultivating relationships with diverse sources and for creating formal systems of tracking the diversity of the sources we use. The best way to ensure this happens, whether you're an individual reporter or an editor or a newsroom leader who is responsible for setting policies for a team of people, is by making diversity a routine part of coverage decisions. That means setting measurable goals for diversity and sourcing, tracking the diversity of sources, and regularly reviewing progress toward your goals. This is something that many science journalists do already, and I believe it's something that every journalist should consider a basic part of their job. In addition to issues surrounding who your sources are, it's important simply to talk to enough sources to give you a thorough understanding of the subject you're reporting on. Of course, what that number is will depend a lot on the type of story you're reporting and the outlet you're reporting it for. At one extreme, a news brief on a study might include only a few sources, maybe a study author and one or two outside sources. But many stories require a lot more than that. A common rule of thumb for many science journalists is to keep reporting until you're hearing nothing but the same things you've heard from other sources. Depending on the complexity of the story, that might mean talking with 10 or 20 people or more. And this, I think, is something that isn't always obvious to reporters who don't regularly report on science. And the reason is that in many of the best and most well-reported science stories, a good number of the people who the reporter interviewed aren't actually quoted or even named in the story, but they've often provided critical background information that has strengthened the reporter's understanding of the research, the context surrounding it, and any areas of scientific debate or disagreement. Sometimes reporters say that they feel guilty if they aren't able to quote every scientist they spoke to. And I do understand that guilty feeling because scientists are busy and we don't wanna waste people's time. But in my opinion, it's actually really ideal to talk with more sources than you can fit into a story because that's a sign that you've done enough reporting. Of course, you don't wanna take that to a ridiculous extreme. There's probably rarely a need to talk to 20 people for a 200 word spot news story. But what might at times feel like over-reporting is actually just careful, thorough, good reporting. 
And the more extraordinary the claim being made, or the more high stakes the subject, or the more preliminary the evidence, the more sources you should talk to. The same is true when it comes to covering preprint manuscripts, scientific papers that haven't yet undergone the vetting process of peer review. In a recent article at the Open Notebook, the journalist Roxanne Campsey discussed this at length. Peer review is an imperfect process, but it does weed out a lot of the really bad papers. So when you're looking at a preprint, you're looking at something that hasn't yet been through the first round of screening. So you should be extra skeptical of its claims. At this point, I've talked a lot about finding sources, but I also want to talk about some of the key skills involved in interviewing sources, and in particular, scientist sources, in order to be able to tell an accurate and appropriately balanced story, to avoid spreading hype, and to debunk misinformation. There's a whole big collection of questions that journalists who are skilled at reporting on science make a habit of asking scientists, and all of them are aimed at understanding the quality of the evidence they're dealing with. Those questions include things like, how many research subjects were included in this study? What outside variables could have influenced the results? Was this an experimental study that allows us to know what caused what? Or was it a correlational study that only shows that one thing is associated with another? How do the results fit in with other studies on the same subject? What are the limitations of the study? Is there scientific debate surrounding the research? It's also important to ask researchers about the endpoints that the study measures and why they chose the endpoints they did and whether they changed the endpoints along the way. Did they measure something that would be meaningful to patients like improvements in symptoms? Or did they measure something that's convenient to measure but might be quite removed from actual results that matter for people's lives? For example, a study might draw conclusions about how many COVID patients have recovered but measure only when their temperatures have returned to normal. Whereas plenty of people with normal temperatures may still be so sick that they can't go back to work or take care of their children or even cook for themselves. Asking these kinds of questions about exactly how studies were done and why they were done that way allows a reporter to weigh where the evidence falls so that they can place emphasis appropriately in their stories. A final science journalism habit that I want to talk about has to do with how we think about what science is and how we communicate that explicitly and implicitly to our readers. One of the defining characteristics of the pandemic, certainly from my perspective in the United States, is the deep level of public distrust of information about the virus. A big part of that comes from the way that the pandemic has been politicized to the point where even the most basic and most urgent public health recommendations are treated by some as assaults on personal freedom. And of course, conspiracy theories, many of them amplified by the President of the United States, have been swirling around almost every aspect of the pandemic, from where the virus originated, to what can treat it, to what it will take to contain it. But a lot of that distrust also comes from the fact that people perceive that scientists keep changing their minds. Is the flu worse than COVID or is COVID more deadly than the flu? Do masks help or are they useless? Can someone who doesn't even have symptoms spread the virus? Do we have to disinfect our groceries or is the risk from contact with surfaces negligible? Why can't scientists make up their minds? Over the months, scientific understanding of the virus has shifted. But what I think is hard for people to grasp sometimes, and what I think science journalists have a responsibility to always be communicating, is the basic idea that that's how science works. That science is, at its core, an incremental process in which scientists try to be less and less wrong over time. Whether you're covering the ordinary, slow, drip, drip, drip of incremental developments in science, or whether you're reporting on fast-moving developments as we are with COVID-19, it can be extremely challenging to deal with the uncertainties that are inherent in all of science and with the contradictions that almost inevitably arise as researchers try to get closer and closer to some kind of truth. The pace of research on COVID-19 has been phenomenally fast, but researchers can only put together the clues so quickly. They can't instantly attain full knowledge of every important aspect of the illness. 
So of course, there have been cases where scientists' initial ideas about the virus have not borne out. That's normal. There's no area of research where the scientific record isn't littered with ideas that turned out with further study not to be right. That's just the messy process of learning through science. In the case of COVID-19 though, it's all happening at such an accelerated pace and so visibly. And that can make this normal, messy aspect of science seem fundamentally untrustworthy, especially if you're someone who's not normally paying such close attention. So part of journalist's job, a big, big mission critical part, is to always be helping their audiences understand that. To, in whatever ways are appropriate and feasible, look for ways to help people glimpse pieces of how the scientific process works. Think about what your readers are confused about and think about what types of stories you could write to help them better understand what they need to know. That can mean finding an approachable way to break down a technical concept like Donald G. McNeil did, McNeil did in a recent New York Times story titled, Why Antibody Tests Won't Help You Much. Or as The Atlantic's Ed Yong did in a recent story on how the immune system works, a story that repeatedly resurfaces the phrase, the immune system is very complicated. Or it can mean creating an approachable infographic, such as the Washington Post's regularly updated graphic that tracks some 200 different efforts around the world to create a vaccine against COVID-19. An equally important task is showing the human beings behind the research. In science writing, we talk a lot about the importance of people in stories. That's not just because people add color to stories and break up the technical stuff. It's because people with all their good ideas and their not so good ideas and their noble motivations and their less noble motivations and their skills and hopes and frustrations and yes, their biases and faults are what drive science. People are the universal fundamental ingredient of the scientific process. Showing the human side of the scientific process means, for example, asking scientists to talk about how they know what they know and what do they still not know and what drives them to do what they're doing. One of many great examples of how science journalists can shed light on newsworthy scientists is Jane Chu's riveting Scientific American profile of the virologist Shi Zheng Li of the Wuhan Institute of Virology who last winter led the race to track down the origins of this new mysterious pneumonia-like disease that had emerged in China. The more that our audiences under the people who do the science, the more equipped they are to think about the scientific process as something that, although imperfect, is just that, a process. And it matters that people understand that because when they don't, they are easy prey for the countless bad actors who are only too eager to take advantage. And never has it been more clear than it has been in the past months what the cost of that can be in human lives. Our best hope for combating the kind of misinformation that endangers all our lives is not convincing Facebook to do it or somehow convincing the tweeter in chief to stop tweeting, though either of those would certainly be welcome. It's in connecting with our audiences and telling stories about science that they can trust. Thank you very much. I thank virtually Siri Carpenter for her interesting speech. And uh, I just want to let you know that all the articles she mentioned in her speech the link to the articles will be available on the SCSJ 2020 website at the bottom of the record of her speech. Now we have a short break of less than 10 minutes and we start at uh, 4 p.m. with uh, two new panels. Uh, so please check the track you're interested in. On track one, you will have the Knight Science Journalism Fellowship Panel on Science Editing. And on track two, you will have the Michele Catanzaro and Andrea Saltelli's dialogue on numbers for policy and science communication opening back. Thank you very much and see you soon.